Good morning, everybody. So good to be here together. I always look forward to Sunday mornings, this opportunity to see you, even if it's virtually, this chance to be together. Lauren, how are you doing this morning? Well, it's sunshiny and the rain washed things last night and I'm feeling like it's a new day. How about you? I got some rest. I'm really excited about that. And uh, I'm super excited about the baby dedication, the child dedication that's coming in this service. So feeling happy about that. Oh, and there's one of the parents. Hi, Karen. <laughs> Hi, how are you guys? We're good. Super good to be together. Good, good. So, hey, I'm going to yes, get it started. Indeed. It's really good to have everybody here. Just a reminder that we are streaming live on Zoom and on YouTube, that uh, the way that things are set up, if you are having any trouble with the audio, remember you can keep your video on your computer, you can call in on your phone so that you can hear everything clearly uh, and we can't see you. So I hope you are comfortable and happy wherever you are uh, as we have worship together. So good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm so glad, like I said, that each and every one of you are here today. My name is Jen Crow. I'm one of the ministers here at First Universalist Church, and I'm grateful to everybody who's tuning in to join us on Zoom and on YouTube this morning. So we gather today welcoming church members and friends and welcoming some of you for the very first time too, as you join us from across the country or around the world today. Thank you for being here with us. It absolutely matters to be together as we get ourselves grounded and strengthen our spiritual muscles so that we can stay in the struggle, in solidarity, working for justice for the long haul. First Universalist Church has been a beacon of love and hope for generations here in Minneapolis, claiming that each and every person in all of their kaleidoscopic beauty and variety is born whole and holy and worthy, is welcome and wanted. Here we listen deeply to where love is calling us next. We welcome, affirm, and protect the light in each human heart and we cultivate humility and courage and compassion and service to justice. And we do all of this as a faith community deeply committed to racial justice. This is the life we invite you into when you journey with us here. So there are all kinds of ways to be involved at church and to get connected here. Let me lift up just a few of them for you today. You can join us for worship, not just on Sunday mornings at 10, but also on Wednesday evenings at seven, if you need a midpoint in the week opportunity to get grounded and centered in your values and to just take that deep breath together. Please join us after the service today for coffee hour. We'll be hosting two coffee hours today, one for black, indigenous, multiracial, and people of color, and one open to people of all identities. I hope you'll grab a cup of coffee or your favorite beverage and come on back right after the service and join us for one of those coffee hours. There are also gatherings happening throughout the week. Like I said, Wednesday worship at 7 p.m. There's also our calming circle, beginning spiritual practice gatherings, opportunities for connection. I hope you'll take a look at our website. And if you're not connected with us through our email newsletter, The Liberal, I hope that you will let us know so we can get you plugged in. We wanna make sure that you know how to be connected with us during this time. So I also wanna remind you for church members to join us uh, after the service next week for our annual meeting. This will be a time when we elect our officers and board members, approve the operating budget and say thank you to the many, many people who make church happen. Next week in worship, we're also excited to be welcoming Reverend Justin back from sabbatical. He'll be returning a few weeks early and uh, we look forward to having him with us again. And we have another big thank you and goodbye to prepare our hearts for, as you know. We'll be saying goodbye to our beloved Reverend Ruth McKenzie as she moves into retirement at the end of June. So I wanna encourage you to take some time over the next few weeks to write a note, send an email, or show up at one of the open Zoom meeting times where Ruth will be to share a story with her about ways that she, her ministry has mattered to you, to say thank you, to say a good goodbye to our beloved Reverend Ruth McKenzie. So I hope you'll make that time and say your goodbyes and your gratitudes. And also I wanna let you know there's an opportunity for all of us to donate to a retirement gift fund for Reverend Ruth. So you can do that by sending a check in to the church or also by donating online. Just make sure that you note that the funds you're donating are for a gift for Reverend Ruth's retirement. 
So now as we prepare our hearts and minds for this time of grounding and reconnection, let's ground our bodies as well. So we're gonna do this by taking three deep breaths together. And I'll invite you to do this in whatever way feels comfortable for you. I'll let you know how I'm doing it over here and you can pick up whatever feels right for you. So I just moved my feet so that they are firmly on the floor. I have just straightened up my back like a tall line, lifting the crown of my head up. I'm gonna lift my shoulders up and drop them down to open up my chest. I've closed my eyes. You can do that or soften your gaze if that feels safe. And then I'm gonna invite you, this is one of the things I learned in my Kung Fu training one million years ago, is to use my hands and my arms almost as a bellow. So I'm gonna lift my arms up as I take a deep breath in. And I'm gonna push it out really, really slow. Then do it again, deep breath in. And then push it out really, really slowly. One more full breath in. One more super slow exhale. Now that we've settled our bodies and brought our spirits here, I invite you to join with me in lighting our chalice. We'll be led together today by Knut and Luna. So if you have a chalice at home, go ahead and grab it or picture one in your mind's eye. And let's say our chalice lighting words together. Please join me for the words of the lighting of the chalice. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Good morning, I'm Lauren Wyeth. And beloved families, I wanna to talk to you for just a moment, just to let you know that we know you're struggling right now. There is so much grief and brokenness in our world, so much isolation and caregiving that is needed, so much to process and metabolize and navigate. But there is also so much beauty and potential in your children so much love in your families and in our communities and mm, so much possibility for a new world to be born. This morning, four families bring children to be dedicated at First Universalist Church of Minneapolis. While Unitarian Universalist child dedications are often a time of joy, they are not one-dimensional. In this ritual, we recognize how deeply we need one another. And we reject the idea that families are or should be self-contained units. We acknowledge that families transcend the limits of blood and law. We recognize your family as you have created and gathered it and honor the commitments and love that define it. We recognize your need for vibrant communities to witness and unfold you, and we promise to be one of those communities. In our ritual of child dedication, the congregation pledges to support you on the journey. They will help you in times of need. They will serve as religious education volunteers and mentors. They will be with you in parent gatherings. They will celebrate with you this milestone and many more to come on the path ahead. We've invited the families who are bringing children to be dedicated to introduce themselves to you as we begin. 
My name is Lena, and this is Winifred Sharon Gardner. She goes by Winnie, and her name, Winifred, means blessed joy and reconciliation. She is absolutely my joy, and uh, her middle name, Sharon, she's named after my aunt, Sharon, um, who is just an inspiration and, you know, yeah, very important person in my life. We are the Oma family. I'm Cass. And I'm Ahmed. This is Joe. Joe is named Joe because according to uh, our African tradition and my tribe, we always name our firstborn Joe according to our tradition. The Christian religion or family usually named their firstborn Joe. That's why it was named Joe. Hi, we are the Carpenter family. I'm Laura. This is Cypress. Darwin. And this is Darwin. Hi, I'm Ashley. And I'm Karen. And I'm Aspen. This is my sister, Eden Lord. Hot Haran. And Eden is named for the Garden of Eden, a place where things are better than they are here and one that we want to work for. And Lord is after the poet, warrior, mother, lesbian activist, Audre Lorde. In our liberal religious tradition, a child dedication ceremony is an opportunity to welcome children of all ages into our community of faith. We know that each time a child is born, one more redeemer is born into this world. We know that none of us are brought up alone, and we recognize the power of community to shape us and to shape our future and our children. We welcome all who are gathered with us today. We welcome those who cannot be with us in this particular moment, but who are with us across space and time. We honor the ancestors who have left this world, but who have never left our hearts. We call them all in right now. And parents, by dedicating your children to this congregation, you are affirming your connection to all of us, and we are affirming our connection to you. We welcome your children with joy and wonder, and we cannot wait to be changed together. Children of First Universalist Church, I have a question for you. Will you promise to love Winnie, Joe, Cypress, Darwin, and Eden? Will you grow up with them and play with them? Will you be a good friend to them? If so, please say yes, or you can type the word yes in the chat if you'd like. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, kids and adults, adults of First Universalist Church. In welcoming and dedicating ourselves to these children, we acknowledge our role as guides and teachers. Will you pledge yourselves to the well-being of these children? Will you promise to care for Winnie, Joe, Cypress, Darwin, and Eden? Will you help their families raise them to love justice and live with compassion? Will you work for a peaceful, just, and sustainable world that they might grow to the fullness of their potential? Will you enthusiastically welcome them as unique and precious individuals that they might know this congregation as a place where they are accepted, known, encouraged, and loved? Congregation, if so, please respond in the chat. We will. Today, it is the parents of these beloved children who will mark them with water on their brow, on their lips, and on their hands. Today, our families will mark and bless these children on our behalf. They will bring this child dedication ritual out of the church and into their homes, into the places where we are all most vulnerable and most strong, where most of us experience most of our frustration and also so much of our joy. We hope that by bringing this ritual into your homes, families, you will feel us with you as you're preparing snacks and singing songs, 
as you're doing homework and cleaning up messes, as you're tucking each other in at night and sharing in hugs. Our love is with you as you do the wonderful work of parenting, of sharing in the creation of family, as you bring your faith into action in your homes, recognizing the inherent worth and dignity of each and every person. Parents, our love is with you as you bless your children today. Winifred Sharon Gardner, I touch you with water on your brow, on your lips, yes, and on your hands to dedicate your thoughts, your words, your deeds to the service of love and justice. And here's your rattle. Touch you with water Search you with water on your, your brow, brow, on your, your lips, lips, on, on your, your hands, hands, to dedicate, dedicate your thoughts, your words, and your, your deeds to the service of love and justice. Cypress, I touch you with the water on your brow. And on your lips and on your hands to dedicate your thoughts and your words and your deeds to the service of love and justice. Darwin, I touch you with the water on your brow, your lips, and on your hands to dedicate your thoughts and your words and your deeds to the surfeit service of love and justice. Eden Lord, we touch you with water on your brow, on your lips, and on your hands to dedicate your thoughts, your words, and your deeds to the service of love and justice. Welcome, Winnie. Welcome, Joe. Welcome, Cypress. Welcome, Darwin. Welcome, Welcome Eden. Eden. We wish you joyful times with your family. Yeah. We can't wait to see you grow up and flourish in the first Universalist community. Our family wishes you a life filled with imagination, curiosity, and inspiration. We wish for you a life filled with wonder and awe. We can't wait to play on the playground. Can you read it? Do you want to play on the playground with the kids? Yeah. We can't wait to teach you the rainbow path. We can't wait to see how you'll spread joy and justice to our community and to the world. A poem for you. My wish for you is that you continue Continue to be who you are, to astonish a mean world with your acts of kindness. Maya Angelou. We, we can't, can't wait, wait to, to meet, meet you. you. We are the f-
Take a minute and you're going to take words and we can't do it. Hello, everybody. Just want to let you know we're aware of the challenges we're having with the audio um, and that we have been unable to hear Karen's prayer, which I know is beautiful. And I know that we're working on it on our end, and we're going to do our best to restart that in just a moment, um, letting her reconnect in uh, as our tech folks are working on it. So I don't know about you, but I can just sit <laughs> with the beauty of those families, the beauty of community, that baby and child dedication. So I invite us to just let the let ourselves take it in. And Karen and our tech folks, you let us know when you're ready to restart if we want to try again. Um, All right, we're just still standing by for a moment. So I'm going to invite us, anybody that wants to, uh, to send some prayers and love to the families that have been dedicated this morning, to use this time for some deep breaths, like we shared at the beginning of our service, that opportunity, if we wish, to use our lungs almost like a bellows, right, for the full breath in. And the full breath out. And perhaps as we're breathing out, we use that opportunity to send love, to send love streaming to all of these families, to all of our families at First You, to stream our love and commitment to them, to build a world where we are all known as whole and holy and worthy, wanted and welcome. Let's take some of those deep breaths and stream that love.
So now we extend this love beyond the children that were dedicated, beyond the children of First Universalist, to all children everywhere. Let's do two deep breaths, sending that love out to everyone. One more deep breath. Full exhale. And now we'll try, see if Karen is connected again. Good morning, church. In a multicultural, multi-generational, multi-racial church, we all have different words for centering ourselves. This morning, I'd like you to find your authentic word and begin to do it now. Think of what that word is. Is it relax, recline, chill, kick back, laid back, mindfulness? We ask it you find that word and its associated posture and do it now. Remember, we can't see you, so you can lay down, you can lean back, you can put your foot on the ottoman, or you can get right back into bed. Right now, we need a few minutes of calm community. For days, our hearts have been racing, our minds have been filled with information and destinations and concern. For days, we have stretched our imaginations and nursed our worst nightmares. It is time for a full minute of quiet. What snuck in to your silence? Did you see images? Did you hear sounds? Did you smell bacon and coffee? In that silence, did you hear a still small voice reminding you that you still matter? In that silence, did you hear a whisper for someone who always throughout your life has repeated to you, it will get better? Did you hear that in silence? Did you hear in the silence a laugh from a loved one who's died? In that silence, did you hear a roar of protest? In that silence, did you hear just your heartbeat? In that silence, did you seek to hear nothing and you finally found your own breath and took a few deep ones? For some of us today, to take a deep breath is a reminder of our humanity, a welcome rhythm that sustains us, guides us. A breath can assure us of life and remind us of the body's first gasp into the world when born and the last gasp when dying. The breaths we take between birth and death are the robotical, miraculous breaths of a being. Breathing lives, breathing lives, breathing, breathing. Breathing lives live with promise, breathing lives with fear, breathing lives that have joy and pain, possibility and surrender. As a church community, we breathe. 
We breathe with each other's sorrow. We breathe with each other's distress. And sometimes we remind each other to breathe. Remind yourself to breathe again today, that precious breath that matters. Sometimes we hold our breath with concern, anxiety, and frustration that we need to speak into this community and sadness as well and remembrances. Today we hold Jacques Capesis, his wife Tracy, brother Chris, and their, their children as they mourn the death of Jacques's father, Joel Leo Capesis. Joel died unexpectedly on June 5th at the age of 84. Jacques says he got his terrible sense of humor from his dad and uses it whenever he can. The family grieves the loss of this good man. What's tugging at you? What concerns are you trying to exhale? Please enter them now in the chat box so that we can all share. So many concerns, so many concerns. Hold them close, let us breathe in these concerns and the names, exhaling grief, concerns about justice, concerns about those we work with, concerns about our neighborhoods, concerns for individuals in hospitals, concerns about recovery, about holding on, concerns about so many things. We breathe in your concerns as a community and we hold them and we exhale. And as we have concerns, we also have many joys. We celebrate with Sarah Hauser, who graduated last weekend from a two-year spiritual direction certification program. We ask you also to add those joys into the chat box so that we can see that many of us are balancing between joys and sorrows, between concern and wonder. So much to be concerned about it, so many joys. The virtual choir work that's going on, joyful. The gardens are blooming. Love with friends, impossible things becoming possible. And of course, our beautiful children being dedicated, awakening and seeing friends on Zoom, going for a walk on Lake Superior, People coming together, people coming together, our most basic and human needs. So as you go about your day, may all of these concerns and joys be small breaths that we take for one another. Throughout the day, remember your breath means possibility. Your breath means life. Your breath means that you can be and do for others. Blessed be and amen.
I'm so grateful for all these voices, all these images, all of you in this community. So this past week, there is a call that went out from the black clergy in the Twin Cities, asking clergy and faith leaders from all faith traditions to join them for a silent march, both in Minneapolis and then in St. Paul. These marches were going to be an important moment in our cities, all of us coming together and symbolically saying, we see you, we follow you black leaders. So they had asked all of us for the black clergy to come to the front, for the white clergy and faith leaders to walk behind, literally and metaphorically having the back of the black clergy. These marches started off in Minneapolis and then later in the afternoon, we headed over to St. Paul. In Minneapolis, we gathered on the steps over at Sabathony at the community center and the black clergy asked all of us to stay together throughout the march, to be quiet, to pray as we walked. When we gathered at 38th and Chicago, the site where George Floyd was murdered, we knelt in prayer together. And then they told us that we would walk back together, that we would not be divided, that we would ensure each other's safety by sticking together. The tone in Minneapolis felt reverent and meaningful as we recommitted ourselves again to this important work for racial justice in our cities. We headed over to St. Paul just a little bit later in the day. And I'll say that for me, the experience there was quite different. When we arrived, there were still lots of folks, black clergy, white clergy, clergy of color, all of us there, faith leaders, community members. But what was different was the presence of the police and the National Guard there. We arrived and some of the things I noticed included that there were National Guards folks stationed all over the place carrying automatic weapons outside of their vehicles. They were all over where we were. A white police escort insisted on getting in front of the black clergy in a car to lead the march. The white police escort led the march while the National Guard closed off the streets. The white police chief from St. Paul marched with the white clergy there in St. Paul a disruption to the quiet as photographers and reporters elbowed their way in to get pictures and ask questions as we were supposed to be marching quietly with reverence in a state of prayer. When we arrived at our destination at the Target on University and the black clergy settled themselves underneath the red circles of the Target symbol, a Black Hawk helicopter flew close by overhead making it very, very hard to hear the voices of the black clergy who had gathered, to share about their experiences, to tell the stories of their trauma, of their lives, to pray together. What I noticed as we were marching in St. Paul was that I felt far less safe in St. Paul with the police and the National Guard so close, far less safe than I had over in Minneapolis. And I was walking with Arif, uh, who many of you know, and I said to him, you know, all these guns, uh, they're making me nervous. I don't feel safe over here. And he turned and said to me, you all make me feel safe. You all make me feel safe. It was the community together that made him feel safe. And I realized it was the community that had made me feel safe in Minneapolis as well. And it was the community that I breathed into over in St. Paul and settled my body, settled my nervous system so that I could hear and really, really listen. It was the shared commitment, the shared presence that made us feel safe. Now, here at church, we've been getting a lot of questions lately. Questions both from reporters and the press, but also questions from within the congregation and across our association. Folks have been asking, what are we doing as a church in this moment? What stand are we taking? What are we gonna do? How can I help? And I'll tell you, I have absolutely loved the desire to be of use in this important moment, this moment that I hope is a portal 
a moment of real change in our society and in our cities. I have loved the desire to be part of something positive. And I've also loved that you know you can look to your faith community for leadership. And you can look to this church as a place that is gonna push you and push our communities toward justice. And so I wanna tell you what I've been saying, what we've been saying when we get these questions, what stand is the church taking? What are we doing? What are we doing? So I've boiled it down to two things, which is super helpful for me because I need clarity in a crisis. So number one, in any situation where people are being harmed, our first and most important job is as best we're able to stop the harm, to stop the harm. So I have been inviting myself and others to be there, to be there in between the police and the protesters, to do our best to provide some sense of safety for our black leaders and our communities by making sure that we're out there with them and also by inviting you to shift your resources, all of us to shift our resources to care for folks who are most impacted in this time when so much harm is being done. So stop the harm, shift the resources to the people who are most impacted. That's number one. And then number two, I've been asking myself and all of us to listen, to listen to the voices of black leaders, to listen to the experiences of Black people in our community, to listen and listen again and listen again. I've had to remind myself that even when I'm asking a question, I am still talking, which means I am not listening. And so listen and listen and listen again to those important voices, to that important leadership in this moment. Now, these seem like simple directions, right? Stop the harm, get the resources to the people who are most impacted and listen. But I know that for myself as someone who uh, is white, as somebody who has raised white in America, actually following these directions is more complicated than I wish it was. And so I wanna take a moment and just speak directly to the white folks uh, in our congregation and who are listening today. And I wanna share a little bit of the ways that I've noticed white supremacy culture coming forward in myself in this time, so that maybe you can spot some of the ways it's coming forward in you as well. Because the, when white supremacy culture tries to reassert itself, especially in these moments of positive change, it is dangerous to the movement and we need to stop it and catch ourselves. So, like I said, speaking mostly to the white folks in our congregation and who are watching right now, two of the ways that white supremacy culture shows up in me, and I've seen this over the years, is in a sense of urgency and also in an inability to really listen. So the sense of urgency for me, it shows up as a desire to do something right now, right in this moment, and I've come to see it pop up in myself and recognize it as something very similar uh, to what happens to me sometimes when I'm listening to a friend who is suffering. When I'm listening to them and what I wanna do is offer a solution, my idea. In these kind of situations, it's usually what I call my bright white idea. Something that I've come up with, right? That's gonna clearly be the best solution that I can apply right now. When really what that is about is about taking the focus off the person who is in pain and putting the focus back on me and making me feel better. That's how this sense of urgency shows up in me. And I'll tell you, I saw it in myself uh, over the past two weeks, there was a moment when I got a suggestion from someone, another white person, that what First Universalists really ought to be doing is leading a national vigil for black folks and people of color and multiracial folks uh, that we should take the lead on, on leading that vigil and we should do it right away. And I am grateful that I've learned to take a deep breath because immediately I was like, national, yeah, we should do that. That's, we're in the position, we're the right person for that. And uh, I took a deep breath and I thought, no, no. Uh, there are actually whole institutions set up to care for the black community and Unitarian Universalism. And uh, it's, not, it's not me, it's not white me. Uh, and I checked in with myself and then I checked in with what I think of as my accountability circle, which is our leadership team here at First Universalist. And they agreed, nope, nope, not our place right now. 
So that sense of urgency in myself to do something, to do something really visible, really big that mattered. I saw it and I did my best to check it, to check it with other people and to resettle and recenter. And I'll tell you, as I'm giving you these examples, I don't always get it right. <laughs> I don't always get it right. I make mistakes. And when white supremacy culture reasserts itself in me, there are definitely times when I need to recognize when I make an error and apologize and make an amend and ask for how will I make it right and then do that hard work. So I wanna to get to that second way that white supremacy culture tends to show up and assert itself in me in times just like this. And that's in, with the inability to listen. Now, I think of myself as a pretty good listener. And I hope that those of you who have been with me when you've been struggling also think of me as a good listener, though I know I make mistakes there too. But here's what I've noticed about myself when it comes to doing what I'm asking all of you to do, which is listen to black leadership, is that there are times when I think I'm listening, when I say I'm listening, when maybe even I look like I'm listening, probably mostly to white people, <laughs> when I'm not really listening, right? Now, I don't like this in myself. I don't like it one bit. And I have named it in myself as performative listening, right? When I make a show of it, I make sure people see me listening to black leadership. But then I go ahead and do what I thought I was gonna do anyway. And when I do this, I cause real harm to real people. So I'll tell you about one of the ways I've seen this showing up in myself over the last few weeks. Now, I think you've probably heard me saying for years at this point that we need to listen to and follow black leadership in our cities. And one of the things that black leadership has been saying in our cities for years is that we need to not just reform our police department, but defund it and dismantle it. They have been saying this for years. And this is something I have found myself having a hard time to listening to, uh, really listening to. I know at moments I've thought, isn't there a more gradual way we could do this? Isn't this a bit dramatic? Uh, isn't there some way we can get there where we wanna be uh, in a way that feels easier for me, that makes me feel safer? But I've been reflecting over the last few weeks. I've been hearing these voices loud and clear again, defund the police, dismantle the police, start again with a system that is based in community and based in the needs and the solutions being presented by the black community. I've heard this again and I am doing my best to really, really listen. So I've noticed my desire to push this away and I am listening differently. And here's what's helping for me this time. For one, I've noticed when do I really feel safe and when do my friends and colleagues of color, when are they telling me that they really feel safe right now? It's when they're in community and it's not when the police and the National Guard are around, just like we noticed at the marches between Minneapolis and St. Paul. When do people really feel safe? When the community wraps around them, that's when they feel safe. I'm noticing that. The other thing is that I wanna recommend if you haven't heard this poem before, that you take a look online and you listen to the poem, give the police to the grandmothers. Now this poem, Give the Police to the Grandmothers, it has sparked my imagination and my sense of creativity uh, because it's full of ideas that uh, have been around for generations and have actually been enacted. So this poem, Give the Police to the Grandmothers by Janonda Petrus, a Minneapolis-based poet and writer and activist, look it up, listen and listen and listen again. There are creative ideas that will work in that poem. There are creative ideas coming out of our black leaders and communities that work, that we know work. So I'm asking myself to open up to creativity and possibility. I'm asking all of us to open up to creativity and possibility to a new way that is grounded and founded in justice. That is a direction we can go. So this piece about listening, I just wanna say this again. One of the things that I've learned about listening is that if I'm really, really listening, then I come to the conversation willing to be changed by what I'm hearing. If I come to a conversation just thinking about what I wanna say and what I think is right and how to do this, and I don't leave any room 
to really hear what the other person is saying, if I don't bring a willingness to be changed as a person, a willingness to change my opinion based on the information and the experiences coming in that I'm hearing, then I'm not really listening. In this community, we ask each other to listen deeply to where love is calling us next. When we ask for that, we're not just asking each other to listen to the same voice in our own head, but to listen deeply to where love is calling us next, to be willing to be changed, to be open enough to truly hear. This is what we're asking of each other. So I wanna reassure all of us that the voices that we need to hear are out there. And they're in here in our church community. They've been speaking and speaking out for generations, offering to share experiences, to tell the truth about what reality looks like. These voices, these people of color, these black folks within our congregation and within our cities, they have been offering solutions for generations. All we need to do is listen and line up behind. That's for the white folks. So, I wanna to talk to all of us now because all of us are needed right now. Each and every one of us is needed in this moment when we can continue to push for change. In this moment when the pain of the generations is present among us, when people are daring to protest even in the midst of a pandemic because they know, we know that we are all dying from anti-black racism already in our country. In this moment when doors that have long been closed are suddenly swinging open, we are called to listen deeply, to be willing to be changed, to listen deeply to where love is calling us next. We are called to welcome, affirm, and protect the light in each and every human heart. We are called to act with humility and courage and compassion in the service to justice, in the service to racial justice. That is the life we are inviting you into. That is the life I am living into with you in this moment. And I'll say there is no one way through this, no one single way. There are multiple paths. Our faith tradition offers no single statement of belief and our church is offering no single path of action, but we are requiring action. Our faith isn't relying on some afterlife where we will experience peace and justice finally. Our faith requires that we create that world of justice right here, right now. We talk about a belief in a world, a belief that each person is whole and holy and worthy, wanted and welcome. And it is up to us to create that experience, to create that world right here, right now. Each of us as individuals in the light of our own circumstances, each of us has a role to play right now. And there is not one answer that I'm going to be giving you about how to proceed. I am telling you to pay attention to the experiences of the people who are most harmed, to listen and to shift resources to their care, to our care. I'm telling you to listen deeply to the voices of black leaders and to follow. Now, back to Unitarian Universalism or right here in Unitarian Universalism right now, I wanna just tell you a little bit about a theologian named James Luther Adams. Now, James Luther Adams is one of the most influential Unitarian theologians of the 21st century. And he's somebody who wrote and acted with the horrors of World War II as the backdrop. He spoke up and wrote about how our faith can matter in the midst of state-sponsored murder, in the midst of unbelievable injustice. What is our faith calling us to do? That is what he wrote about. So he said, and I agree with him, that we must continue to evolve as a faith community. We have to go past the one move we had made at that point, right? Which was, as he said, the move of the liberal church into the priesthood of all believers. What this meant was as the church moved from Catholic to Protestant or that shift happened, we came to believe that each and every person could connect and should connect and had a responsibility to connect with whatever they felt was most holy, most divine, that there wasn't the need for an intercessor, a priest in between the individual and the divine or the holy, that we all had access, that we all had to find our way to connect. 
Now, James Luther Adams said that was one good move and we need to make one more move from the priesthood of all believers into the prophethood of all believers. Now, what he was saying by this is that each and every one of us has a responsibility to pay attention to what is true and real and what is happening right in front of us, to listen to, to see the violence, the injustice, the ways that the state can oppress people and that is oppressing people. And each of us has a responsibility, the prophethood of all believers to speak that truth, to name that truth and to push back against the oppression of the state. The priesthood of all believers, the prophethood of all believers. That is what we are called into today. Now, I cannot help but see the connection that today, as our families blessed their children, they took that priesthood of all believers right on into their homes. It was the parents, the families who blessed their children on our behalf. It was the parents and the families who were the priests, if you will. And it is time, it is time for the prophethood of all believers the prophethood of all of us as we move the church out into the community, move the altar from this place and this building out into the community to speak the truth, to name it, and to push back on the systems of oppression that are killing all of us. The priesthood of all believers and now the prophethood of all believers. We are called to the world. We are called to the work of the world to the work of love and justice. So First Universalist, may we listen deeply, willing to be changed by what we hear. May we listen deeply to where love is calling us next. May we welcome, affirm, and protect the light in each human heart. May we act with humility and courage and compassion in the service to justice and service to racial justice. May this be our call today and every day. May it be so. Amen. So today, like we do every Sunday, and like I invite us into actually every day of our lives, when we can, let us share our resources. Our resources of money, our resources of time and talent, to the creation of a better world than where we are today. So today, as we take up our offering, I wanna remind you too, that if you are finding yourself hurting, if you are finding yourselves in need, our community is here for you. We have financial resources to share that we would like to share with you, with your family, with those who are hurting right now. We have resources of care, of listening, of community. So we are here for each other and we are here to build a better world. So our offering today will be a 50-50 split between the church and the Black Visions Collective. So you may give in all of the ways that you've become accustomed to here in our online world. You can text to give at First Geneva and select Sunday offering from the drop-down menu. You can make your donation on our church website through the Square Cash app, through mailing a check to the church. Make a note that this is for the offering for today, June 7th. And again, our offering will be a 50-50 split between Black Visions Collective and First Universalist Church. So as you give, or as you think about the ways that the church can support you and reach out to us to let us know, we're gonna listen together to a beautiful music from the First Universalist Choir, a collaboration between our choir that happened earlier this year and students from the Anoka Ramsey Community College where Randy teaches. And you'll hear this beautiful music put together with images from the protests that have been happening over the past week here in the Twin Cities. So let's settle in and enjoy this together.
problem with the world, Father. Live it through discrimination in this nation. We have nothing here to be proud of. Depression rising and our health declining, yet the problem rests on it. Immigrants, what's that got to do with us? Fighting one another when we could be working together to make the world better. Think of the children. Raising them to hate rather than to be tolerant. It's intolerance that causes us to fear something that is different from us. If we could just realize that we are different than one another, then maybe we could see those things as beauty in each other. Rise up, we will be strong together. We will get by. Soon we will see the glory if we just try. Hold hand in hand, let us be one that when it's all done. contemplate the love that we are not giving to each other. Everyone's killing each other with hatred and violence. We have to stop this right now. We even got the children crying. Father, please give me a reason why we have to live like this. Everyone's broken. Where in this life could we have some bliss? Because if we don't have no bliss, how in the world would we ever fix this? When people don't even care, all we're ever going to do is be aware, but I'll still rise up. Be strong together, we will get by. Soon we will see the glory if we just try. Hold hand in hand, let us be one. And when it's all done, We are rising up. We are rising up for justice. We are rising up in the name of love. So friends, I wanna remind you that we want to be connected, that we are all connected. Please join us for coffee hour after the service. Remember there's a black indigenous multiracial people of color coffee hour happening right after the service and a coffee hour open to all. Remember we wanna be connected let us know if you are not receiving emails from us so we can stay connected to each other. Remember there's worship on Wednesday at seven as well as worship together here on Sundays at 10. Friends, it matters that we are together. We are safer together <laughs> as a community pulling together. We are working for love and justice together. So, Please know you are blessed. You are a blessing. Our love is streaming out to you, to all of the families and the children who were dedicated today, to all the families and children of First Universalists, to all the families and children, to all people all over the world. We will create a world of love and justice where our faith that says that every person is whole and holy and worthy, welcome and wanted, will be not just a vision, but a reality. May it be so. Amen. I invite you to join in singing with us. Go now in peace.
grateful for Franco's beautiful music for all of us together. We'll now extinguish our chalice. I invite you to type in the chat box if you wish. I carry the flame, we carry the flame as we move our altars out into the world. Amen. <laughs>